chair of the session, I'm supposed to introduce the speaker. I guess most everyone here knows Rana Adhikari, who will be talking about, uh, I don't know, whatever Rana talks about. I, I talk about the future, Stan. Anyway, it's not necessary. This, I have some slides, but it's, it's just some photos. Uh, I'll, I can tell you what's the, the topic anyway. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this, uh, a little bit like what, what Satya is mentioning, that uh, one of the things that it's very important we avoid is having this uh, desert in the gravitational wave world, like we did before the advanced LIGO, where essentially for the last 100,000 years, we had no gravitational wave detections. And now we are in a period where uh, the sensitivity is increasing, uh, and we are able to do better and better. And each year, this is something a little bit newer and more exciting coming on, which makes it uh, fruitful for new people to get into the field. And I remember what things were like in the, in the bad times around the year 2000, when uh, we had no, no signals and we were all thirsty for something. And not only were we thirsty in terms of the science output, we were thirsty in terms of uh, talent input into the field. And most of all, I don't want to go back into those days where nothing new is happening. This is like a nightmare for me. So it's, it's one of the things, it's sort of the, the theme of this that I'm talking about, is how do we avoid um, that kind of world. So <clears throat> I'll, I'm just going to talk, uh, Yo has already told you about Einstein telescope. So I'll tell you about a few plans and some options we have um, from the U.S. side, but I think pretty soon we should stop talking about this like it's a U.S.-Europe difference or something like that, but we'll have to take these big projects and split it into some different pieces so that each of the countries can contribute something and make everything go faster. This is probably, this in the next few years is the last time in the world where uh, one country can do the whole project by themselves. After that, it would be implausible. Um, so uh, Ajith said we should not talk about, uh, explicitly said we should not talk about space-based detectors. So here, uh, I want to talk about space-based detectors, mostly. That's the main thrust, is that here, Yo is still here? Okay, good. Um, it's great that Chris asked this question, which is how plausible is it to go down to one hertz? And Yo says, maybe. And I kept my mouth shut because he had the microphone and I did not. But now I will tell you, just forget about it. Like you want to go below 10 hertz. The advanced LIGO and the LIGO has been working for years and years. We cannot even get to 10 hertz right now. And uh, what I want to stress is that it is naive to look at these noise curves and think that we really understand what's happening. This is what you get with a pencil and paper sitting in your office and computing things about the fundamentals. And it, it, I don't know, it just sort of, my head catches on fire when I hear people talking about these things because uh, it's so naive. They say, well, there's a thermal noise and there's a quantum noise and I guess that's it, right? That's all that there is in the world. But we know for sure that uh, no gravitational wave detector in the world has ever been limited by thermal noise. And yet people talk about it all the time, thermal noise, thermal noise, thermal noise. And the same goes for the quantum back action. It's a goal. I and mean, people work for like eight years as a PhD student just to observe quantum back action, and they never do. It's one of those things that's not really limiting us. By orders of magnitude, what limits us is more technical noise and vibrations in the environment. And the reason people don't talk about those is it makes us uncomfortable, especially after lunch. To, to think about these issues is so upsetting because you struggle for years and it just doesn't get better and you try things. It's the, it's the kind of the worst kinds of research where you have a great idea and then you try something and nothing happens. It's not better or worse. And so it's as if you have no control over the world. It's really up, uncomfortable. But anyway, so I'm showing you things about just quantum noise and thermal noise here because what else can we do? Uh, but the idea is that in the ground-based detectors, the uh, cosmic, uh, Einstein telescope and the Cosmic Explorer because of the great uh, design of the vibration isolation and the system being so long, uh, potentially you can get down to the lowest frequencies if you were only limited by those things. But what I'll show you soon is that absolutely we're not limited by those things. And we're limited by other things. And you shouldn't say, um, because those things are non-fundamental, um, some technician is going to come in and fix it. And it's not noble work like quantum noise reduction. You know, here we are, noble 
pure scientists, we work on the greatest topics, and those people who are not that talented will work on these technical things. It's just the opposite. Uh, improving the quantum noise of the system is kind of like this. It's easy because it's just one thing. It's simple. It does what you think. All of the other things which actually limit us are way more complicated, and that's why it's never been solved. But we, but we need to. So when we think about what to do in the future, we want systems where those fundamental things find their solved. But we also want the technical things not to be so terrible. Um, and so one of the things uh, um, I'll talk about a little bit is this in between space mission, between uh, LISA and the Chinese Tianqing missions, uh, we could fly some sort of uh, low cost uh, Desi Hertz mission, which is not for the cosmological background, but it's to find the sources which live in the band from 50 millihertz up to 10 hertz or something like that. And I will argue that it's much, much easier to do something simple in space than it is to do something extremely complicated at the limits of our ability on the ground. At the ground, every one hertz that you try to go, you're fighting. It's like spitting into the hurricane, and you, you won't win. And in space, it's kind of just like falling off a lot. Easy. Um, so this is a, a cartoon which shows you these type of things that we usually worry about. And, and the quantum fluctuations come from the usual vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. And they're beating with the static laser field in the system we also contend with this. Uh, the basically equipartition theorem tells us that there would be thermal fluctuations of the mirror surface. And because the resonances, each of the eigenmodes has a finite quality factor, some of that energy leaks into the band where we try to make the measurement. And those are the main fundamental things we worry about. Um, this thing is really important when you think about the low frequency wall. And you, shouldn't, you should not really be that concerned about the direct vibration from the ground to the mirror. The thing that will really, really limit us is the fact that the gravitational perturbations are uh, insurmountable at some point. And which is to say, uh, even if you've measured correctly all the vibration of the ground, meaning you have something like 1,000 seismometers measuring the full ground motion, you would not be able to accurately predict the true gravitational potential at your mirror within you know, anything better than 90%. And it's because if you really want to subtract all the Newtonian gravitational perturbations in order to get, let yourself get from 10 hertz down to 1 hertz, you will need to have uh, something like LIDAR systems which measure all of the clouds in the atmosphere, you know, something like several kilometers of density perturbations in the air and make a model and subtract those. And that's really, uh, is starting to become the kind of elaborate Baroque system which uh, we should not try to make because it's gonna limit us. And this is a little bit of the picture I wanted to show you. Um, on this curve, this is the frequency and this is the estimated mirror motion. And these dashed lines are the kinds of lines that you can calculate using pen and paper. And the reality is that we have a lot of this other noisy stuff, sort of stuff that actually limits us. And the thing to focus on is in the low end that uh, these lines here, this is the thermal noise and the quantum back action and these things. But the, the actual noise that we have is orders of magnitude larger. And this is in the most sensitive interferometer. This is the one in Louisiana. And of course, we can do better than this. We always do better each time. But the idea that we would do something like 100,000 times better in the next 10 years is just, I, I find it laughable. Um, anyway, Yo is a, also an expert on this Newtonian gravity uh, subtraction. So he, he knows better than me how, how tough it is to do these subtractions, I think. Uh, it's, not, it's not that we will completely fail, but I think the idea of subtracting a factor of 100,000 or a million is very challenging. Um, so, uh, yeah, he mentioned about what, what would be the great science outputs of the next thing that we do. And in order to avoid this desert where we don't have anything new, I, I, there's this idea I go around talking about a lot, which is what can we do in the existing facilities, meaning in the existing LIGO, Kagura, Virgo, and then what would we do in uh, India after the first uh, run? Meaning in the year 2030 or something like that, what would we do here so we would really get to the cosmological level? And that idea is this concept called the LIGO Voyager. Um, and he's already shown you this uh, different cosmological reach. This is sort of the noise breakdown of the two systems. And then this paper is something like a scientific justification for this project. And it, talks about uh, the Sarah Gossin and James Clark looked into the 
supernova physics, and Jocelyn Reed and Masha Okunkova, and uh, people, Vladimir Durgachev looked into the neutron star physics, and the rest of us focused on the uh, compact binary stuff that you could get out of it. Um, the basics is this, is that we would get something like a factor of several in the middle band, and then maybe also at the, at the high frequencies and not much improvement at the low frequencies. It's meant to just use uh, cryogenics, heavier masses, and so on. Um, and if that works out, as I think it will, I think there's no major risks involved, we would have something like uh, the range of 1,000 megaparsecs using the existing facilities. And that means we would have sort of in the category of uh, 30 to 40 detections per day, which would be nice. Um, I say this thing about 1,000 megaparsecs for binary neutron stars, although I think we know there's really no electromagnetic possibility of doing follow-ups at a gigaparsec, but it means that we would have enough source, you know, enough things happening within 300, 400 megaparsecs that future, future EM telescopes could do a follow-up, at least up to that point. Um, so th then the next bigger idea is this cosmic explorer, um, which is to build a 40-kilometer system. And what that does is says, let's use the existing technolo te technology of the advanced LIGO, room temperature optics, uh, one micron lasers, and so on. And we just extend it. And what that does is it gives you something like a factor of two improvement on the LIGO Voyager in the middle band. Uh, but then really where it works in the highest frequencies, uh, you get a factor of several on top of for the neutron star merger and the equation of state. And at the lowest frequencies, it's, it's really, it's more than an order of magnitude improvement. So that is a, that's really the way forward in the, in the long run. And that gives you um, sort of a, a robust place to start the next generation. You've now put in, if you can get, if you can get it, meaning if you can get the something like 10 to the $9 that you need to build one of these, or maybe I put this twiddle there, which means around 10 to the 9, maybe one over root two of this, or root two times this. And uh, of course, you have to build more than one of these. Maybe you can put a three here if, the, if you want to see what's the true cost. If we can get these through some international collaboration, um, maybe through some private money, uh, I, I don't know. There are some people who have that kind of money. Uh, this would be great for the far future, but um, we should keep in mind this timeline here we are. We have not reached the advanced LIGO sensitivity. And we have plans to go to this thing, which people call advanced LIGO plus. Um, but actually, that technology is not in hand. Um, if you look back at this thing, this is, the, this is our best estimate for the current thermodynamic fluctuations of the mirror. And we have a lot of plans and a lot of effort which are going into making improved mirrors. But as NEO showed you this very important timeline, which is if in the year 2024, you'd like to have this running, you, something like now or next year, you need to have the solution, which is what is that magical mirror material which will give you no thermal noise? And that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist right now. So uh, something could still happen this year or in the beginning of next year. But if that doesn't happen, then we don't have that improvement in the middle of the band. And the advanced LIGO Plus will not be uh, this boost from 200 to 300 megaparsecs, but instead will be uh, 180 through 220 or something in that range. We'll still get the improvement at the lowest and the highest frequencies, but there won't be the big, big jump in the neutron star rate. Um, and that, it worries me because I do not want um, to be stuck here at below 200 megaparsecs until the year, you know, 2035 plus N when the Einstein telescope and cosmic explorer come on. So we need some plans. Um, when India comes online, which is this orange one, um, we'd like to make sure that it ramps up to this level. So that's, that's my hope, and I hope all of, all of you are convinced and agree with me that we should set up things to upgrade in that way. Um, yeah, so um, in my last couple minutes, I just go back to this space idea. Why, why am I in favor of this? Um, it's been my experience in the last 20 years of working on these machines that we turn them on and almost immediately 
we have the high frequency performance that we wanted, and there's nothing complicated up there. You have more photons, the proportional photon counting noise is less. And that's just how it works. It's easy to do. And with the advent of the squeeze light technology, which is pretty easy to use, you turn it on, you increase the squeezing factor, and uh, the high frequency noise is less. And that is fine. And as long as we don't struggle to get anything at the low frequencies, where most of the in spiral time is and when the high mass mergers are, we would be fine. But if we want to struggle for what's happening you know, beyond 40 solar masses, or if we'd like to have uh, a really long in spiral to find out what's happening, uh, if there's dispersion in the signal, or if there's a difference between in spiral and merger, we had better go to low frequencies. Um, and I think that's possible by going into space. And you tried this last time, and I, at the last time I gave this talk. No, I didn't. Yes. You did in Penn State. So let me let me just let me just finish. Was it four years ago? No. Uh, so anyway, to, there's this paper which is out. It just came on the archive last week, or earlier this week, um, and it focuses on this decihertz band and what are the scientific reasons for doing it. And I'm not going to go into the details of all those, but um, one of the things I wanted to highlight is this one, which is the localization ability. And uh, for binary neutron stars, uh, at, at these redshifts up to redshift of one, if you have this network, if you have this space detector in combination with this Voyager on the ground, then it's not the kind of thing that you get like we got with this uh, mass gap signal, but it's the kind of thing uh, that you dream of, which is that for most of these signals, the angular resolution that you get is in this uh, uh, less than 10 to the minus one degrees. And for things that are really close, like less than one gigaparsec, the angular resolution is something like 10 to the minus three degrees. And so that's at the point where you can take a really large, big bucket telescope with a small field of view and just stare in that direction and you can find it. And this will give you easily like uh, a month of early warning so you can point into it. Um, so I, I I'll stop there um, because the thing ran. And Alessandra wants to ask a question. So you, if you can, oh, this is a picture from the uh, Nobel Museum. It's a letter written by Einstein. But you can read it for yourself. Alessandra? Yeah, but maybe we figure out. Um, I was just uh, wondering about Voyager. Uh, if, if you could uh, explain what are the improvements uh, from yeah. advanced fiber, the technology that you have to. Oh, I like this question very much. It, Really? <laughs> I did, yes. I skipped it, but I, want, I actually wanted to talk about it. Um, so it has to do with, ooh, um, uh, basically the laser power is, imp is increased by a factor of four. Um, that's not so special. Uh, squeeze lights used. The main special thing is this, the, in the mirror technology. Um, for reasons having to do with uh, dull condensed matter physics, it turns out that at room temperature, any amorphous thin film that you make has kind of a limit to the internal friction. So the imaginary part of the Young's modulus is always uh, 10 to the minus 4 or higher of the real part, which makes it that the, the Brownian thermal fluctuations will, will never be decreased beyond a certain limit. In this design for the Voyager, uh, we use a special material which, uh, as far as anyone in, has ever been able to measure, has no internal friction. And that's an amorphous flavor of silicon. And we operated at a particular temperature, uh, medium cryogenic temperature, where it seems to be very perfect. So it has uh, no loss. And then we switched to using a longer wavelength of light. And that one is less sensitive to the roughness of the mirror. And so the optical losses you get are, are, are less. And so the squeezed light capability becomes higher. Sorry, the big improvement at low frequency, you have a, an improvement at low frequency. I ah, am. Yeah. Uh, so this. Which is, cannot be just that you this, the coding. You know? Right, this comes from the mass. So the uh, mirror goes from 40 kilograms to 200. And that 200 kilograms is something like the largest piece of silicon that the silicon industry can make these days. And that's feasible. That is uh, today possible. Uh, the future could be better, but I don't count on that. Uh, hey, 
Rana, this is regarding coexistence of space-based and ground detector. So, two years ago, you mentioned that there is no such future in which you can, uh, you will see the spiral and then you will be able to predict when it will merge, uh, especially regarding electromagnetic observations. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? So, for example, from 0 0.1 to 10 hertz, if it, there is space-based, yeah. uh, you will be, you will know when it's going to merge, especially for electromagnetic, uh, like by the star, and then, yeah. so, so you think that there is a such future that... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay, great, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, for, for all of the sources that we we're considering, in this frequency, I mean, it's so far from merger that it's, the post-Newtonian approximation is just fine. And if it's not fine, then uh, we ask Bala to add a, nine halves expansion or something like that. And 